introduce to you Amy Lee Campbell. She's our next speaker. Here she is right before you. She, um, she also is referred to as the HTML, um, spelled H-T-M-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. She's celebrating 2012 as her 10th year as an entrepreneur. She's the co-founder of and creative director for Pink Collar, a Web 2.0 creative agency. Pink Collar specializes in helping women business owners think, link, and ink. She says visit them on the web at pink, uh, pinkcollarinc.com. So let's um, have her come up and, and teach us something. Inbound marketing. What is that? How many people are how many people in this room are hearing that term for the first time? Okay? A fair amount. Who already engages in inbound marketing? Okay, I'm gonna pick on you, my seat buddy. What tell tell us about inbound marketing. Give us a brief summary. Well it's um, rather than people accidentally finding your company, it's the marketing to pull them in. And so it's anything that I do on behalf of my client to get anybody out there that might be a potential customer to come visit our site or our blog. That's that is ninety seven percent correct. <laughs> And to come to the place, be it your blog, your site, your Facebook page, uh, but then once they get there, learning as much as you can about them. Okay, so that's the crucial 3% that, uh, in terms of the, the work that you have to do, is make, you know, you can do all of this work to get people to come and visit you, but then if you don't capture that information about them, then has it all been for naught? I'm hoping to convince you, not exactly, but with just a little bit extra work, uh, all of your efforts will bear fruit. Um, so the, uh, the caveat that I want to give is um, I know that you all are very savvy, and I've already been told. I was about to take some of them. I was telling Jennifer that I always panic before a presentation because I worry that I'm going to get this glazed look, and so I go through and I start deleting the really advanced stuff. And she was like, oh, no, no. She was like, oh, this group is way ahead. She was like, they're very good. And I was like, okay. So, um, so having said that, the caveat is that um, my goal is to blow your mind, but in a good way. And so <laughs> um, definitely feel free to stop me if I'm just talking gibberish and you don't understand. But I am going to introduce you to what I think are maybe going to be some advanced things. Um, and you are going to need a little bit of discipline. Um, who, who, uh, there was a session, early, one of the session descriptions earlier was about, um, you know, uh, discipline, and discipline and ritual. Thank you very much, DD session. Uh, and so inbound marketing, not only do you have to have the technical know-how, uh, the actual steps, which I'm going to teach you, but you also have to have the discipline to be able, bless you, to look at the numbers. Um, I, it was serendipitous because I, I woke up in the middle of the night and I was thinking about you all and coming to speak to you all and, um, and I've done this before and it popped into my head. I watched the Today Show and I don't remember her last name, but I just call her Dr. Nancy. But I remember Dr. Nancy saying one time, she was like, if you wake up in the middle of the night, don't look at the clock. Because once you look at the clock, you are going to start, and this is exactly what I do, you think, all right, I went to bed at 11. I have to get up at 7. That's 8 hours. It's now 3.30. If I go back to sleep by this time, then I'll have this much sleep. And she says, don't look at the clock. Because regardless of whether you wake up at, what did I say, 7 or 8, and if you're fully rested, if you have already calculated in your mind that you haven't gotten enough sleep, it's going to affect how you are that day. And I always think of that because I, I look at the clock. I have to look at the clock. And if you're like me, you gotta have the, the you wanna know the data. <laughs> I wanna be able to make a decision, I want all the information possible, okay? Some of you in the room may be people like Dr. Nancy who say, no, don't look at the clock. Just go by how you feel about it. If you feel rested, you're rested, okay? What we're gonna do today with the information I'm gonna give you is I'm going to teach you why it's beneficial to metaphorically look at the clock, okay? 
it might cause you a little bit of anxiety, but um, the last caveat I'll give is that if you are the kind of person who does what you do because you love it, you make enough money at it, and you don't want to look at the data and the metrics because that is a bummer, it's a buzzkill, and it just brings you down, then I encourage you to just go ahead and eat and enjoy your dessert and just imagine my voice as like the Charlie Brown teacher voice in your head. Okay. Uh, but so for the rest of you, I'm going to teach you why. You need the data. You need to look at the clock. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Two basic uses for inbound marketing. Uh, and I hesitate to call this level one and level two and prioritize one over the other. Uh, because they are both crucial and you are going to do both of them in an inbound marketing campaign. Uh, but we'll start off with the first one because it is, after all, the first one. It's where you have to start, okay? This is probably where a lot of you are, is you want to know who visits you, okay? Uh, what do they do while they're there? And when they leave, is it because they got what they wanted or because you didn't give it to them, okay? Two is the more advanced stuff. It's, okay, all of these things, who is coming and what are they doing while they're there? And then two is that 3%, okay? So 97%, 3%. While, the, while you have them as a captive audience, what can you do for them to get them to give you information, to give you permission to communicate with them in the future? And we're going to talk about Facebook's open graph. Um, learn some things about them that they don't even know that you're learning, and two, that they may not even know. Okay? So let the mind blowing begin. Okay. Okay. If you take a major cruise line to Trinidad and Tobago, Turks and Caicos, or U.S. Virgin Islands, when you get home, has anybody taken a cruise to these places recently? When you got home, was there? A, how long ago was it? January. Oh, that's about the right time frame. Um, have you started getting coupons for Sprite Zero? Which cruise line did you take? No, I went with Western Oh, okay. So it wasn't a... Okay. Oh, it would have been so good if you had taken a cruise line. Uh, when you get home, um, you're going to notice on your computer, your, because your travel confirmation probably came through your email, and if you have ads that pop up beside your email, one of them is going to be about Sprite Zero. You're going to get a coupon for Sprite Zero in your mailbox, okay? When you scan your, um, gosh, it's been so long since I lived in Charlottesville, Harris Teeter, Kroger. So when you scan your rewards card, it's gonna, you're going to get something for Sprite Zero. Okay. So what they have, what Coca-Cola has determined is they have this niche I mean, Sprite Zero has a big dem demographic, but they have this niche for people who come home from cruises to these certain cruise lines, most major cruise lines to these places. They can, if they send out a coupon for those, 14% of Coca-Cola's coupons on average get redeemed. 48% of them get redeemed when they do it this way, okay? So clearly it works, okay? Average American family grocery shops, it's like something weird, like 1.34 times a week or something. Um, but so let's say an average American family goes to the grocery store once a week. Okay. If they can get you to buy Sprite Zero on four out of your next six trips, you are a long-term customer. Okay. So think of a lot of money is spent doing this. But... Over time, they have, and they have, you know, there are 10 or 12 case studies about different brands and products like this, about how they have taken the opportunity to 
match up data against data against data from grocery store rewards programs, from cruise lines, from their own uh, um, locations or franchise partners um, in restaurants in these places. And they combine all of that. They have very smart people who look at all of that data. And they say, OK, we know how these people act. And not only do we know how they act, if we nudge them in these few ways, we have captured their loyalty. And I tell you what, it is far less than a Super Bowl commercial. OK? All right. Now, having said that, I, I keep pointing it at the screen like it's a television. <laughs> so maybe I, maybe if I just. Right. No, I'm, um, it's, I could tell you a million funny tech stories about my parents and grandparents. I'm their IT person. And um, there's no such thing as the internet in our house. You're just on the computer. If you're on the computer, that's what web surfing is. Mom's on the computer, OK? Um, all right, Coca-Cola. Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, website, uh, Tumblr, Flickr. What do you, and, and so first of all, we were talking about Sprite Zero. This is going to be Coca-Cola, the company, and then in one case, it's the brand, uh, but, or two cases, I guess. But what do you notice about all of these different things? Now, keep in mind, I just told you, Coca-Cola, the company, they're experts at figuring out what their ideal customer looks like. And don't you think if they know that much about their ideal customer, well, they could make these match a little bit more, couldn't they? I mean, branding-wise. Yeah. I think they match the last design of each according to who this is Oh, very good, very good. Sorry, I, that was a leading question. Thank you very much. You're a very cooperative audience. Um, the reason that these look so differently, and keep in mind, all of these social networks have certain parameters about design and things, but even within that, you can see how these are different, OK? Um, and, and, you know, we could take time and talk about each of these in detail. Why they look a certain way is because Coca-Cola not only knows who drinks Coca-Cola, but they parse that down into who uses social media, different social media sites, okay? And so each of these is specifically designed to appeal to that subset. Okay, I'll just use for an, an example, uh, the Tumblr site is focused mostly on Coca-Cola, the nostalgic brand. Okay, it's not so much the drink as it is the art around it, you know, the Warhol, that, you know, that kind of thing, um, the vintage advertising. Uh, other Things such as you know the Facebook page and the Twitter page. It's very classic Coca-Cola. You don't see when you go to the store and you buy Coca-Cola. It doesn't look like maybe I can do it this way. It doesn't look like that bottle. It doesn't look like that bottle. It's a can. It's plastic. Okay, but why do they use that old glass bottle? OK? Even though Twitter and Facebook skew younger, older users will go to these pages. OK? If you are baby stepping a baby boomer or older into social media, this is one of the first places they are going to like and follow because it's so familiar. Okay? So they're not targeting teenagers, right? That's, if you go to the Powerade page, that's all about teenagers, okay? Or Red Bull. 
okay? But classic Coca-Cola, even though social media tends to skew younger, Coca-Cola knows that they are still targeting that nostalgic market, okay? And so I give you the example about Sprite Zero and the cruise line, and I give you the examples about the way to vary your branding. And I do that because I want to convince you that this is what data gives you, okay? If you can, through inbound marketing, learn enough about your potential customer and how they act, you can give them exactly what they want, okay? Okay, uh, Jane's answer at the beginning, or Jane's answer at the beginning uh, was correct. That it's, it's, you know, traditional marketing is the message you put out, 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 okay? And so that's what this is, is all of your different networks, you know, you may have talked about this in one of your sessions today. Has, it, has anyone covered syndication and services like Hootsuite and things like that where you have, you know, um, Let's say you make your primary account your Facebook account. Or no, let's, let's just go, for most of you in this room, it's probably going to be your blog. So every time you post a blog, it syndicate, you know, if you're using a syndication service, it goes to Facebook, it goes to Twitter, it goes to LinkedIn, it goes other places, okay? So that's traditional marketing, is we're going to push it out. We're going we're gonna, to uh, syndicate our content, okay? But, no. Okay, um, what I want you to realize with inbound marketing is that it's not just pushing it out, okay? Two-way conversation, and this is the, not, again, the 97% versus the 3%, is it's not just what you want to say and you want to push it out. Some of you may be blogging because you just, you got something to say, and that's terrific. Most of you are probably doing it in service of a business model. You're trying, you're blogging about a service or about a product that you eventually want people to hire you for or to buy. Okay, so this is where inbound marketing really comes into play, is you push your message out, but then when people come back in to whatever landing place you've set up, what are they expecting to see? And how do you capture their information? You have different technical specifications with each one of your landing places, but the concept is all the same, is I want to interest you to stay around long enough, okay, that I can capture some information about you, and then sort of the next advanced level is actually giving something in return. Uh, how many of you offer a, like a free white paper if they sign up for your email newsletter? Or if you subscribe to my blog, uh, the blog feed, I'll give you, what, anyone? All right, let's just back this train up for a second. <laughs> okay. Why are you blogging? Why are you blogging? And what is it that you do? Okay. And so when someone comes to your site, what happens? They find the content that we find interesting to them, like healthcare, uh, food, interest, something in town that takes a click and listen. Okay. And do you pay attention to where they come from? I do, yeah. Okay. Do you pay attention to where they go after they leave your site? Do you pay attention to, I don't mean to be picking on you. Um, do they always listen to the first podcast because it's the first podcast or because it's the best one? Do you have some that are wildly popular? Yeah. Why? It's the interest is there. So it's the topic. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
All right. Um, completely forgot where I was going with that. Okay, so. <laughs> What can you, so nobody has any kind of free offer. Well, let me just ask it this way. Do you have a, do you allow people to sign up for your RSS feed? Oh, see, that's it, that's it. Okay, I just said it the wrong way. When, if people sign up for your RSS feed, do they get something? Other than just the joy of your continued knowledge. Right, just the joy, no actual thing. Um, what if I told you that Email, newsletter signups, and RSS feed signups are the most common place that people start with inbound marketing. If people are going to put in their email address to sign up for your um, RSS feed, your email newsletter, what if you also ask them their first name and their last name? Okay. Those are helpful pieces of information. And then if you think they'll tolerate it, how about their zip code? Okay, for most people, no big deal, especially if you have a privacy policy, okay? Um, how many people could implement that when they leave today? Oh, okay. You were that exuberant about the point. You were like, I can't wait to do this. Okay. If nothing else, please start there. Is just even if you're not sending out communications, just start capturing that data. And then, you know what? We don't, you don't even have to start there because by the end of this, you're going to be way past that. So, but for anybody who's leaving early, start there. <laughs> okay. Okay, and so my point on that being, you can take little steps toward capturing people's information. I'm going to show you some more advanced inbound marketing strategies and stuff about metrics, but if you just ask people for their first name, their last name, or you can be you know, not fancy and make yourself a little Excel nightmare and just ask them for name and not separate the first and the last name. Um, a lot of my clients do that to me. Um, they send me a list with name, and then they're like, send this email, dear Sue. And I'm like, I can't magically take the first names out. <laughs> um, okay. But so first name, last name, they already have to put in their email address and zip code. Okay. And if I for, uh, hopefully I won't forget to talk about it. You don't have to ask them their IP address. Your form software should capture that. Okay. Okay, so you're tracking stuff that goes on. What do you use? Google Analytics. Google Analytics. Someone was saying, I hear Google Analytics was being poo-pooed earlier in the day. Um, but uh, uh, what I was saying to my table mates is that about a month ago, Analytics and Webmaster Tools were, and actually AdWords um, to some degree, were the interface was redesigned and so if you chucked Google Analytics before because you thought it was too hard to use, give it another try um, because it is, it's a lot more user friendly now. Um, what do you track? Um, amount of downloads and amount of uh, traffic to the site itself. So download per podcast and download and then just uh, people coming to the site. Now are you going through an iTunes channel? Uh, I'm not with the new site I started yet. Okay. Okay, so so when you say download, you mean you you have the raw data yes. about downloads. Okay, okay. Who else tracks? What do you track? I have a website that promotes the county of Greece, so I have traffic back about the GoDaddy. Okay. And it tracks what country, zip codes, it tells me how many hits, what page they entered on, what page they exited on, what their search engine was, what their uh, browser was. Keywords they use to get there if they Google it, do a search engine with it, and it tells me how many pages were accessed in which pages. Okay. And once you get those numbers, what do you do with them? I look at which pages are being accessed the most, so if I have to prioritize my time, like Dee Dee was talking about, mm -hmm. I, I stick the ones that are the most accessed first. I work on those first class day contact. I 
look at something if it doesn't get that many hits, because the stuff content stays up there, so I've got up to 300 pages up okay. there. Now. If it doesn't get that many hits anymore, I take it down. Okay. Or I change it. But if it gets a lot of hits, then I continue on that content side. All right, now I'm going to be a Miss Know It All and pick on you a little bit. What I didn't hear you say is you extract your own activity out of the stats. Yeah. You do do that. Yeah. You do. Yeah. Okay. What? what okay. <laughs> All right. Maybe I don't. What do you mean? Okay. Um, do you? If you get you how eight, eight thousand hits a month, mm -hmm. how many of those were yours? No, I don't extract those. You'd be surprised. Yeah. No, I count my. How misleading the number is. But I don't know. This is why I never give my clients raw stats anymore yeah. because they see 8,000 hits, but 3,000 of them were mine. But and I could, so, I could because I couldn't go by the IP addresses. Yes. Okay. So I'm okay. so I'm going to show you a little graphic on that. Okay. So generally, you know, unless you're CNN or something, when you look at your stats, it's ranked. One of the sections is going to be about visitors ranked by IP address. The first one's going to be you. It's going to be a lot more than all the ones below it. You got you to subtract it, okay. okay? And there are some more sophisticated programs that will do this, allow you to put in your IP address and they'll just get rid of it for you. If you're looking at raw stats, like GoDaddy uses all stats, um, which is the same thing we use on our server. And so you're just, you, got to, you have to know your IP address and you have to take it out. Um, so yeah, so you track a lot of stuff. Um, and so you say you take down the content if it's not getting many visits. Um, and then another thing to think about is how many of you discount spiders? Oh, um, Googlebot, Bing crawler, search engine things, little search engine things that go out and you know all the work on SEO, all the work you do for search engine optimization, the little what they call spiders that go out and read those. Okay. It's not a person. It still is um, traffic. Like it's still, as far as Google is concerned, if you have you know 5,000 hits from the spider, it, they still count your 5,000 hits, but they count everybody else's too. So it sort of comes out in the wash. But for you specifically, you need like if I say you have, if I tell you you have 8,000 hits, if we take out a thousand of them are you and two thousand of them are search engines. Well, or let's talk about it in terms of people. If I tell you you have 150 people. Um, now, the one I have does tell you visitors and which ones are unique. Okay, so, that, so that's really a, a very uh, crucial yeah. number. Yeah. Yes, okay. So, um, you know, a spider is going to, each search engine spider is going to count as one. You're going to count as one. If you do it at home and at, at your office, that's actually two. And if you do it on your iPad, that's three. Or no, if you're going off of a off of a wireless signal, it's probably all the same. But so anyway, so it, it can be a little bit misleading. Okay. For the room in general, do you use that data to make decisions? You do because you take down content. Okay. And you, I assume, do because if you have a podcast that's a real stinker, you're going to maybe get rid of it, right? Or just don't do that again. Or maybe we'll, do the, we'll take the silver lining, which is the ones that are super popular you get immediate response. You know, like, yes, that was a good decision. Yay me. Um, okay, so who else? How do you use, do you use data and how do you use it to make decisions? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what do you find? Okay, um, let me ask you this, and this is, might be a little bit far-fetched, but um, have you ever thought, how many people follow you on Twitter? Okay, and how, you, you post four times a day on Twitter. You have 800 people that follow you. So you have 3,200 impressions. How many of those 3,200 lead to site visits? That I don't know, but I can tell you on a daily basis I get maybe one or two people that come from day to day. One or two. Okay. Shows up. I, I don't know. So, 
I hate to break it to you. <laughs> we might need to change your Twitter strategy a little bit. <laughs> Is your demographic on Twitter? Oh, yeah. Okay. What do you do? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm just a blog. Okay. Public relations, one. And the other is um, marriage coach. And the marriage community, marriage therapists, counselors, they're all over Twitter. Who's following you? Is it competitors or customers? Um, both. Both. Yeah, and a lot of random people. On Twitter? 60% of the people that follow me are people who do the same thing I do. And so it makes tweeting so unfulfilling for me because I'm not actually talking to people who might hire me. Um, so that's one thing to think about. Twitter in general, is that popular with people in the room? A little bit, kind of. I will tell you one um, great way to use Twitter is um, through syndication. Hook Twitter to your blog or your website and use it as your breaking news feed. You know, sometimes there's just little stuff that maybe isn't, maybe is appropriate for Facebook, maybe not, but it's just a little something that you want to put out there and it doesn't deserve a whole blog post. It's tweet. And you, and you have it as a running chronological thing on your site and it becomes your breaking news. That's how we use it. Okay. So what I was showing you here are some actual metrics from a, a client of mine. And it's like the, you know, the, the bottom line, what you want to track, what they track in terms of their sales. And so most businesses are familiar with tracking based on, um, oh my god, I'm, so, I'm doing so poorly on time right now. <laughs> that is not at all shocking. OK. Um, so uh, you, you track sales in your business. And so tracking metrics is not that much different. I, I won't spend a lot of time on here so I can keep going, but um, I will give you copies of these slides too if you want. Um, here are the six things I want you to track if nothing else. Okay? Visits and visitors. Okay? Pages per visit. And so visits Visitors and pages per visit, these three numbers work together very nicely. And there are lots of fun little math equations you can do with them, dividing and multiplying. Um, and uh, average time on site is a very unique number. Uh, for you, it's going to skew high because they have to download something, right? Okay, and so. It takes longer to download something than it does to just read some text. So your number's going to skew higher, and you're, you're going to know that because you're going to watch it over time. Um, bounce rate is, uh, first of all, it's very handy in terms of just telling you what's wrong with your site. Okay? But also, if you are getting a high bounce rate and the bounces are coming, and you'll know this through inbound marketing, if people are coming from Google or they're coming from Bing or they're coming from Facebook, and they get to your site and they leave, it's going to be in the zero to 30 seconds. It's because whatever led them to come to your blog or your site was not what you delivered. Okay? That is the best metric I can give you for whether or not you are actually, if you're blogging about something and then your product actually, if you say you have the most awesome thing, you know, the widget ever, and people go to buy your widget and they find out that it's out of stock or it actually has terrible reviews or whatever and they, they just leave, okay? That number, that's going to tell you why. After you discount all the things that are just, if something's wrong technically, that's what that number is going to tell you. Um, what do you do? Uh, I host and I'm a webmaster for whatever platform this Facebook is. Okay. Uh, the, the folks send me, uh, I have my own account for what I think is not true. If you're above 20, you're in big trouble. If you're above 20, you're in big trouble. If you're below 10, you 
you still have some work to do, but that's acceptable. Um, it's that range in between that I would give you some leeway. If you are engaging in an active advertising campaign, Facebook ads, Google ads, um, something on the side of a bus, that is, that number is going to fluctuate a lot. Uh, and so as long as you stay in that range, just that number is going to give you a wealth of information about, um, I always think of that Modern Family episode where Phil has the car wrapped and he doesn't mean to do it, but the wrap ends up being kind of pornographic, <laughs> even though he's a realtor, he's a, he's, a, he's a real estate agent. And so he gets all of this traffic and all of these phone calls and he thinks his ad is working so great. And meanwhile, people are calling because they think it's, they have misunderstood the ad. Okay. If Phil had looked at these numbers, <laughs> he would see that his bounce rate is very high. Um, okay, so last thing on the page views. Um, I want you to ignore page views unless you do, you have, you're like the conference where you have some advertising on your site. Okay, it's just, it, it's just, you need a PhD in statistics to understand how that factors into the other numbers. So unless you offer advertising on your site, ignore page views and don't, don't factor that in. Everyone knows what page views is. It's, you know, how many times a page has been viewed. Um, I think the visits, visitors and pages per visitor are much more accurate numbers. Yes, ma'am. You're talking about QR code campaign? How does it affect that rate? Okay, the pr your premise suggests that a QR code is sending people to your website. Right. Do not do it. It annoys the bejesus out of people. If you want to do a QR code campaign, you need to build a mobile version of your site. Or if you're running on an open source website, you need to install Gantry, at least 3.20 or higher, which automatically detects it's being viewed on a smartphone and reorganizes your website for smartphones. If you have a QR code campaign and you're sending people on a mobile phone to the regular version of your website, it's going to jack up your bounce rate. Okay? So this is not going to read well on the, on the screen of the smartphone? Right. And there's so much stuff you can do with QR codes. Rather, I mean, you don't even have to, like I think if you go to qrstuff.com or ah, there's a couple of them where just for free, you can make a QR code and then you can just have it pop up a message and then they can continue to another place. Uh, but, yeah, just do a very scaled down version of content. And in fact, I am, I am positive that there is a free WordPress plugin that will, depending on the customizations you made to your theme, that will just automatically detect a smartphone and just turn your blog post into something that's very easily readable on a smartphone. W oh, I think that's it. I think that's it. Yes. Okay. All right. All right, so this is what we were talking about before, is there are, if, you, if, if you're on GoDaddy or most major servers or ma major hosting platforms, you're going to use a program called Stats. You don't need to know the name of it. That's probably what they use. And so you're going to get this big, long thing of information when you click in there, and you can sort by, like, week, month, year, whatever. And so you're going to get panels of information. And so there are three I want you to pay attention to. Hours of the day, OK? Um, right here is, I chose this because it's, it's typical, OK? Where is the spike in activity on this site? Lunchtime, right? Lunchtime, OK? This, these numbers come in handy. Um, I have a client that is a, uh, works with real estate investors. Most real estate investors have day jobs, and their interest in real estate investing is early morning, lunchtime, late at night, on the weekends. Their numbers look totally different. And that's what we expect to see, is these people are not visiting the site during the workday. They're doing it other times, okay? So you have to, this is what I was talking about with the looking at the clock thing, is you have to know where you're starting in order to be able to detect the changes, okay? You gotta look at the clock and count, okay, how many hours till I get up? How many hours till I reach my goal? 
Um, connect to site. Don't freak out if you see a bunch of foreign websites and URLs on here. Everybody has it. It doesn't mean you're about to get hacked. Okay? Um, like Russia. That's the only one on here. Um, as long as it stays low in terms of the number of people visiting, it's probably just some somebody invented a new search engine and it found your site and they'll be gone in a month and don't worry about it. Okay? Oh, and this is what I was talking about with um, uh, oh no, that's links. Okay. But this section is generally where you would look to take out search engines. See how they separate search engines from other links? Okay, and here's the holy grail. Visitor IP. Okay, so the, guess what my IP is? Okay. If I just look at the total number and I don't take out my stats, I, well, it would be very dishonest of me <laughs> to tell my client that they had this many hits on their site in the three weeks after they launched in the first of the year. Okay. Um, yeah, that's going to be a bummer for some people. And so I'm, I'm just going to say in advance, I'm sorry. But you got you to get the data. You got to know the numbers. Okay. All right. When I talk about inbound marketing, you have already seen this. And so I'm just going to show you an example. This is a, um, an email that I got, okay? And it tells me, first of all, they know enough about me to know what I'm interested in. And so they have targeted me. They said, hi, Amy. Uh, and they want me to download an email, an ebook, okay? And so their eventual goal is to get me to refer their service to my clients, okay? And so they're going to talk to me. They know that I'm very interested in data. I like bullet points. And so they're going to give me just enough information to get me to click through. Okay, so that's step one. Okay, once I get there, again, very personalized to me. A lot of white space. I don't need a fancy image. Okay. They're going to give me just enough information. And in exchange for me getting this free ebook, they're going to ask me a couple of questions. Remember, talking about first name, last name, email address. Okay. So this is what I want you to think about in terms of your next step in inbound marketing: is instead of having people just sign up for your RSS feed, maybe say, and you know, get a pot free podcast. Or um, I mean, this is obviously most easily done if you have services and products that people pay for, and then you can give one away for free or a heavily discounted rate. It's just something, it has to be just enough of an incentive. I call it a shiny thing. It has to be just shiny enough that they go, okay, I'm gonna give you a little bit more information, okay? Key thing about this is when I clicked through the email, where did I not go? To their website. I did go to their website, but I didn't go to the home page, okay? So two things there. One is, don't distract me. <laughs> Just, I want to see the offer. I'll give you my information. If I'm interested enough in the company, I can always click that logo in the upper left and go and learn more about the company. And I didn't crop anything out of this. This is literally, like, the, there's white on the other side. This is literally the entire page, OK? And so the key point there is they asked me a lot of questions, but they were all above the fold. And so, and then I think all but one of these, I think the last one is not required, but all of the other ones are really easy drop downs. And they, the reason that they can ask more questions, and if you have a demographic that is tech savvy, you can get away with this too. My computer auto fills all of these for me. 
And so I don't mind answering a few more because all I have to do is type the first letter and hit return. Okay? And so you can get away with asking for more information if you have a more tech savvy demographic. Okay. Okay. Um, we talk about your ideal customer. Very few people have just one. How many of you have more than three? Okay. Give me, how many do you have? I know people that would come to a blogging conference, okay. a wine festival, want a wedding, want to do their own corporate event. Okay. They have a lot of interests, but how many types of customers do you actually have? If I drill down into the demographics, First, well, there's only two genders. Are they professionals? Typically, yeah, I think they would all fall into the same. Are they married? No. Okay, so. Well, some are and some aren't. I mean, with different. Okay. How many different zip codes do they live in? Probably 100. Are they, in this, are they all in Charlottesville and no. the surrounding area? Okay. Wow, well, yours is complicated. Um, okay, so <laughs> you're, a, you're a bad example. Um, most people, you say, oh, I have eight different demographics. Well, really is, and what I was hoping, I bet if we drilled down into yours, I could get to this point. Um, what I was hoping to do is show you that you may think you have a bunch of different demographics, but the core things that you're actually marketing to, you can get them into three groups or less. Okay? So in this example, this is my CPA, I think I mentioned earlier. She has three basic groups of people. Okay, and so everybody knows what a conversion is. The way you define a conversion may be different, but basically a conversion is that someone respond to the call to action and buy the product or service. And whether it takes you two steps or 18 steps to get them there, you need to define what a conversion is. Okay, so for you it may be from the time they get the information or let's say they get a coupon for the wine tour to the time they complete the wine tour all those steps completing the wine tour paying for it and doing it that's a successful conversion or if they just visit the information page maybe you take it easy on yourself and you say okay well that's a conversion okay yeah, yeah. Right. Right. And so you start off like, keep your expectations low. Like, and that's the thing about you know, people talk about statistics and data, but if you make it easy on yourself, like, well, I just want to get 8,000 hits this month. That every hit is a conversion. I'm going to consider that successful. Keep it, your ultimate goal here has to be something more than just views, unless you are, you know, as I was saying earlier, unless you're just spreading love and you're spreading the knowledge. Okay, if you're actually running a business, be really particular with yourself and your team about what is a conversion. What is it we're actually here to do? Okay, so for this CPA, she knows, she has these three groups. A conversion brings her an average of this much money. Okay? Okay, I, I told you the six key site metrics. So you have those in your head, or five really, because I said discount page views. So there are two things here. You have your, your, your five, kind of six key site metrics, and then you have your buckets of information, okay? And so if you leave here today and you're feeling overwhelmed, two things I want you to do. Figure out what those five slash six metrics are, where you're starting from, and then start with a demographic and figure out these five things, okay? This is pretty self-explanatory. What do you know about them? What do you not know, but you need to know, okay? What is the least hassle for you, free podcast, whatever, coupon, that you can give away that still is incentive enough for them to give you some information how do you reach them? Where are they? 
and then who influences them, okay? So the whole big thing that we talked about today is one of the things we haven't considered is earned media, okay? So there's no way to schedule NBC, the local station, to do a story about you, but you can still factor it into your inbound marketing campaign. You can still prepare for it, okay, if you know that that is something that influences them, okay? And actually, in terms of influencers also, what I was talking about with HubSpot, making the page clean, keep the, the fields that you fill in above the fold. Um, doesn't need a lot of graphics. Don't give me more than two paragraphs of text, okay? For my demographic, that is the key. If you want me not to bounce, that's what I need to see, okay? All right, so like I said, I'll give you copies of these slides, and as you drill down into this, you'll see, but this is actual, this is the actual piece of the campaign that we used for this CPA, okay? Um, the group in the middle is a little more than half of the revenue per conversion. Why is that the sweet spot? Okay, so they're a multi-year customer, that's true. Um, also, maybe this isn't as obvious, there are just more of those. Okay, so if you're going to go fishing, go where there's fish, right? So even though these people make more money per conversion, there just aren't that many of them. And so... We have a lot of information about them, but inbound marketing isn't really the way to reach them. Uh, we know we have a winning strategy with real estate investors, and it's enough money per conversion, and the pool is big enough that we know that this is gonna bear fruit, okay? So whether you have one, two, or like Jennifer, 18, um, flush these things out, okay? Here's a little chart that you can, I'll give you a blank copy of it. Just go through and figure out what can you offer? Who's gonna be interested in that? And then your groups, I have three up here, figure out what they're going to be interested in, okay? So if you take your, if you have your five slash six metrics, if you have your demographics and their five buckets of info, and then you have what you can offer, okay? What you'll see is when you get that information on paper, all of a sudden a lot more stuff starts becoming clear and you're just not operating in the dark anymore. I see so many people who say, we spent $5,000 on Google ads and we didn't get a thing. I, have no, I don't know what to tell you. Why did you spend that much money? Because it worked for my sister-in-law and I, we thought we would try it too. Okay, don't do it, don't do it. Start with the data. Okay, actual examples. Uh, the Dandelion Patch in Vienna is one of our clients and they are, have a very popular store. They have five locations. Um, uh, I instead of just, especially if you're a retail location, instead of having people sign up for the um, email newsletter, if you're not a digital type business, maybe that just doesn't work for you. Um, they do have a digital presence, but most of their activity goes on in their bricks and mortar location. So. You sign up for their Bay and Freebie, you print out this coupon, okay, and you go in the store, in any one of the five stores, and you redeem it, okay? So some of you may be saying, well, you just gave, I mean, how do you collect information about these people? Okay, so this campaign is predicated upon having the open graph, which I'll tell you about, hooked up. Also, there's a system in each store where the first time someone buys from the dandelion patch, all that information in those fields you saw from HubSpot, that is collected from them by the salesperson. And then it's just like your rewards card in the grocery store, okay? So you just forgot that you just gave them all that information, okay? So if I redeem this coupon in the Vienna location, well, I just printed out a coupon and redeemed it, okay? But they know when I printed the coupon, 
when I actually redeemed it, what I bought, okay, and a lot of other stuff about how I even got to that page in the first place, okay? And here is what I want to tell you that's going to scare the pants off of you. This is common practice now, okay? You think you're just printing off a coupon. Like my cousin has this thing where she goes to those coupon printing sites and she prints off, you know, she has a little baby, so she's all in, you know, that. And she prints off coupons and she just thinks, and then she gets all of this junk mail and she does not see the connection. And I'm like, all of your activity is being tracked. And they know that you will redeem these offers and they know that you are a, you know, you've been married for three years, you have a three month old, you live in this zip code, you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's where it gets a little scary, right? Is because there are a lot of privacy issues. So we could have a whole other discussion about that. Is I could give you a whole other talk about how you need to protect yourself as consumers. But I think far more interesting is for me to tell you how to exploit the system as a business. <laughs> so let's just focus on that, shall we? Okay, so, um, all right, so this is how, okay, so what, I guess I should say here, you can redeem the fan free, freebie, you can go to the blog, you can follow on Twitter, you can join the email list. Keep in mind, where people come from is tracked. Where they go is tracked. What they do there is tracked. And once you redeem that coupon, you are connected to your in-store activity. And it's like, boom, light bulb goes off. They have this enormous customer profile about me. And I'm going to, this is really going to blow your mind. My mother's birthday is a few days before Christmas. I've never told anybody that, but I did post about it on Facebook. I get different emails about my mother's birthday versus holidays from them, different offers from them. Okay, so that's, you know. Whatever, you can know when people's birthdays are. You can send them coupons. Here's the thing that's gonna blow your mind. They have personalized it to the degree that they know that I have to buy. It's not just I'm in this demographic and that demographic. They know that I have both, okay? They know that I have a birthday and a holiday back to back. And so they pitch me specifically on that. Why not get your mother the, and it, actually this is one place where it kind of went awry because my mother's not savvy, whereas I'm tech savvy. And so their suggestion for me was, why not get her a Vera Bradley iPhone case, an iPad cover, and give her one for her birthday and one for, right, so that's not appropriate for my mother. But still, think about what went into them getting to the point where they could suggest that to me. I was like, wow, I was, I was very impressed. Okay, Okay. back to the CPA. Um, again, just like HubSpot, um, keep all the information you want to give them above the fold. And um, I also recommend, if you don't already have something called reCAPTCHA, R-E-C-A-P-T-C-H-A. -E it's a free plugin. And it's just going to add um, this box to the forms you make. Well, first of all, let me ask, do you already know how to create forms on your sites? No. Well, it's, a, it's just a plugin. Yeah, it's just a form plugin. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you can, you can do it with Google Docs, you just don't get the good analytics. But there are lots of free plugins that you can put in and do a form. Um, one of the things you'll notice is about two weeks ago we changed this because the list of places that you could have heard about them had gotten so long that people weren't even looking. They were just choosing one of the ones that was visible. And it was skewing the data. And so now it's just a blank field. And so manually we have to go through and say, okay, when they say, um, BP site, the 
system doesn't know that BP site and bigger pockets website is the same thing. We have to manually go through and say, okay, those are the same thing. But we get more accurate data. It's just more legwork. And so again, figuring out how much you can ask and get away with, that's why you look at your bounce rate. Is it's a little bit art, a little bit science. Okay. So here is where the rubber meets the road. I showed you in your analytics how you track IP address of where people come from, where they come from, what they do on your site and where they go. This is how you figure out who those people are. Is because if you can convince them to give you their information based on whatever shiny thing you're offering, you can capture their IP address. Okay? So now you take those metrics and you take their activity on your site and you take the information that they just gave you and it all becomes one nice little profile. Okay? This is the JV way to do it. I'm going to show you Facebook's open graph, which is the varsity way to do it. Okay? Are there any questions so far? I know I'm like way over time, but can we just keep Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and in case I, in case you don't already know this, um, when you're tracking your day of time, I mean time of day and day of the week, um, that's why it's so important to understand what it is on an ongoing basis, because then those spikes will jump out at you, and you you know you can be your own little Sherlock and say, well, what happened there, that all of a sudden, like I, I'm doing a site for my college reunion this summer, and we just have this huge spike in traffic last night at 8.30 p.m. And normally when there's a spike in traffic, I think someone's trying to hack the site. And so that's why I pay attention to that kind of stuff. Um, nope, everything was fine. I have no idea. I still have not figured out. I was on the phone with my co-chair this morning trying to figure out what happened at 8.30. I was like, did you post something on Facebook? Um, I mean, it's a good problem to have, but... I have, you have to know where you're starting out from to be able to see what happens. And the good thing about it is if those spikes in traffic are positive things happening, keep doing it. Okay? Okay, I'm going to run through this very quickly. If you are going to do official landing pages and not just, um, you know, like a, like a form on the side of your if you have the ability to create separate pages, okay, and use them just for the purposes of an inbound marketing campaign. Here is how to get really good at it. Ten things. Okay. State what the offer is. Oh, and I should say over here, this is um, uh, Im importance to people, okay? And so, again, this is in the aggregate, not necessarily my demographic or your demographic. So figure out what, you can test these and figure out what the importance is for your people. State the offer very clearly. Free e-book. Okay? Um, there's no way for me to show you SEO relevance on a graphic like this. I can't give you an example of it. Um, but basically, this is where your bounce rate, again, comes into play. If people come to your site and they leave very quickly, they are not seeing what they expected to see, okay? It could be because you misled them, or it could be because for some reason you have meta tags and keywords on this page. Maybe if you copied a page template and used it again, it still has the met, this is a common mistake, it still has the meta tags and keywords from the thing you copied. And so people, so that spiders are indexing this page, but you've changed all the content, right? But you didn't change all the meta tags and the keywords, okay? So that's why you can, you can copy pages over. I recommend creating new because you want to regenerate those meta tags and keywords because that's what search engines are going to look for, okay? 
Uh, third thing, no nav bar. Again, do not distract them. They are not coming because they are interested in your website. They are interested in the offer. Okay? Scannable content. I can quickly read it. Only ask me what's relevant. And especially, don't make something required. Well, I, I don't know. There, the schools of thought vary on this. I say, if it's so optional that it's not required, then don't ask it. But I don't. Other schools of thought say, "Hey, some people are just—they just fill out any. My, they're my cousin, and they will just write down everything you want to know about themselves." Uh, one good graphic. Don't do any kind of slideshow, fancy stuff. Just one good graphic. Uh, okay, descriptive header and descriptive button go together. So here's the offer. Over here, there's what I have to fill in. At the top, it's download your free copy. At the bottom, it's download now. The difference is that button does not say submit. Okay? You'd be amazed at how, if, it, if this were my personal list, that would be much higher up. If I think I'm going to have to go to another page or do something else to get this free ebook, I'm not going to do it. If you put download now on the button, much higher conversion rate. Okay, and then finally, if people do want to get to your main page, Link your logo in the upper left-hand corner. Okay. All right, specifically for bloggers, okay? Your conversion may not necessarily be a sale, okay? Because you're blogging, you're trying to generate interest, okay? And so capturing leads isn't necessarily appropriate for you because you're not necessarily selling a thing at that particular time. Okay? Inbound marketing is still relevant. It's just you're, you want to capture activity based on comments instead of people's actual leads. Okay? Instead of customer leads. Okay? And it's the same process. Do you allow people, do you just have open commenting on your blog? What do you require of people to comment on your blog? Yeah, if you write a blog post that I think is fabulous and I want to comment on it, what do I have to do? Okay. And then what kind of information do you get if I do all that and make a comment? You get that information. Oh, and actually, let me, um, I showed you, you know, where I was saying this is the information you get, and here's the IP address. I just wanted to point out, that was an email that is an optional thing where my client gets it every time somebody signs up for that offer. The data itself is, goes into databases, right? It doesn't, it's not just in the email. So, you get an email probably that says so-and-so made this comment. And are you tracking those people's activity separate from just general site activity? What's your con what, what's just defined as a conversion for you? But you're selling something on your site. Okay. Okay. So I would think ideally, if you're, especially if your blog and your site are separate, you're trying to, a conversion for you would be getting a commenter to go from your blog to your site. Well, I have a lot of other sites, so I'm really just interested in getting um, Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, again, you are, may want to track this, and most people do track it comments on blog posts separately from just general site activity and if people have to put in their name and email address I bet it's it's logging IP addresses as well be interested to see how those numbers match up how many people come to your site versus comment yeah okay I mean and and that's actually not that uncommon um, but for you it may be a goal to like increase that as a conversion, okay. 
Okay? All right. Last thing is, uh, you've seen this a lot. This is the New York Times. You go and you log in with Facebook. Okay. When I sign up, when I give you my name and my email to comment on your blog or to sign up for your RSS feed or whatever else, I'm giving you certain pieces of information. Instead of going through all the forms, hook the open graph, Facebook's open graph, into your website, log in with Facebook. How many of you have seen this? Everyone has seen this. Um, have you ever looked to see what you're actually giving them permission to do? Right? Okay, so this is where it gets into, as a user, it's kind of scary. As a business, it's pretty cool. Um, this is how the dandelion patch knows when my mother's birthday is. Okay? Is because she's listed as a family member. Her birthday is on her profile. It's linked to me, and I have given them permission to access my information, including list of friends. Okay? This is free. This is free. Okay? Allow people to interact with your site using Facebook. Developers.facebook.com is where you get started. I'm going to be doing an, and so I know the inevitable question is, okay, you've convinced me I need to do it, so how do I do it? In about a month, or I think it's May 19th, I'm going to be doing a webinar for the National Association of Women Business Owners starting here, basically. You know you need to do it, but how do you do it? And so for everybody that's here, make sure I have your information and I'll make sure you can participate in that webinar for free. Um, it's how to hook it in. Okay? You may be able to figure it out. Go to developers.facebook.com and you might be able to hook the open graph into your site. This is just another example of how um, without even realizing it, I have given this site information about me. So I'm, I'm logged into Facebook. I go to this site. I hit like on here. And, you know, it says allow, whether I comment or not. They have tons of information about me. Tons. Okay. Um, we talked about meta tags. Um, you, just to do the like or share, this is where you start, is you just put, your, you're going to get a meta tag, you put it in your, you go to that base, HTML file on your, in your control panel, and you just insert that into here. Okay, that's where you start. All right, truly, truly, truly the last thing I'm going to say, because Jennifer gave me the evil eye. I'm just kidding. Um, uh, it's not just about getting to know your customers. It's about, ultimately you want to influence their behavior. Okay, so here I've given you an example of how we had a customer, we've had a long-term customer, and they have this autumn slump for some reason, and it's not even common in their industry. And so we said last year, we said, what if we did an inbound marketing campaign and really heavily targeted and see if we could change people's behavior, that they don't need to wait until the holidays to do blah, blah, blah. What if we could just convince them that they need to do it in July, August, and September. And we did. And we did. If you get to know your customer and what they react to, just like a Coca-Cola with Sprite Zero, you can influence their behavior. And that is the whole ball of wax. That's the end goal. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Yeah.